let's talk about uh, the first years under the Constitution. Washington was elected president. He was the first president. Um, when Washington uh, became president, he um, uh, there there was no there was no template, I guess you could say, no tradition for what the president was supposed to do. So Washington assumed the role of an elected king. All right. So now what we have to think about is what is a king in this? What's a traditionally, theoretically, what is the role of a king? And and theoretically, the role of a king is to represent and to protect the people, to be the father of the people. And so, so one of the things that Washington did when he was elected, he said, well, I, I'm here to represent all of the people, not just the people that like me, although everybody liked him, liked him, right, essentially, right? So I'm here to represent all the people. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose people as my helpers, as my cabinet, who have differences of opinions. And so, uh, so he chose for his treasury uh, secretary, Alexander Hamilton, and he chose as his secretary of state, Thomas Jefferson. And, and Hamilton and Jefferson had actually at one point been friends and allies, but they had very different ideas about what the Constitution had created. Hamilton had the idea that the Constitution had created a national government that could uh, steer the United States toward becoming a great commercial industrial power that would rival Britain. And, and Jefferson thought that the Constitution created a landscape where people could live uh, in, in peace and freedom on the land and not worry about the rest of the world. So, so what happens is that these two actually uh, get into uh, vicious arguments in the White House over policy. Uh, and, um, and eventually what's going to happen is that Jefferson will actually resign. But but uh, the, the main thing, actually, he, he resigns from Adams' administration. But the main thing to, um, to, to take away from this is that there's two, at least two very different visions of America. That's the name of your textbook, right? But they, they use it differently than I do. Okay, visions of America. The two different visions are the America that is the great economic power and the America that is the landscape of liberty. So, so we can think about the divide in American politics as between economics and ideology, right? On the one hand, uh, the, uh, the, the people who believe that the policy of the federal government should create this uh, great economic power to make a lot of people rich. And on the other hand, there's the group that thinks that the government is there to protect our freedom and our rights and, and allow us to live in, in liberty uh, out on the land, right? Um, and these two, in the beginning, were irreconcilable, right? What do I mean by that? I mean, what I mean by that is that, um, is that those people who were in favor, those people who followed Hamilton saw the people who followed Jefferson as wild-eyed revolutionaries. But Jefferson actually said, we might have to have another revolution. A and those people who followed Jefferson saw those who followed Hamilton as monarchists, people who wanted to scrap the constitution and establish a monarchy, right? Uh, and so both sides believed that if the other side took control of the government or kept control of the government, they would lose the country, okay? And because of that, there was a real, there was no sense that they should actually um, uh, compromise. Okay, you guys are with me? Questions, comments? So, so here's what happens. They, uh, the people that follow Hamilton and the people that follow Jefferson form up into two different groups, which is going to be the beginning 
of our two party system. Okay. Uh, the people who follow Hamilton are going to be called Federalists. Now, the one thing I want you to understand is that the Federalists that follow Hamilton, the Federalist Party, is not the same as the Federalists who were in favor of the Constitution. All right. So, so in the constitutional debate, we had Federalists and Anti Federalists. The Federalists were for the Constitution, Anti Federalists were against it. But now in the first party system, we have Federalists and Democratic Republicans. The Federalists are the ones who are in favor of strong central power economics. And, and Democratic Republicans are the ones who lean more towards uh, idealism. Okay, you guys are with me? And they're different. So, so people that were Federalists uh, in the constitutional debate, like James Madison, uh, are now Democratic Republicans in the first party system. You guys follow what I'm saying here? I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just saying you need to keep these things separate because they use the same name for two different groups of people. Okay. Questions, comments. Okay. All right. So let's talk about what they believe here. First off, uh, the, those who follow Hamilton are Federalists. Those who follow Jefferson are Democratic Republicans. Um, the, some of the famous uh, Hamiltonians are people that agreed with Hamilton or Washington and John Adams. Uh, people that agreed with Jefferson or Madison and Monroe. Uh, Hamilton believed that there should be a, a strong central government, that the, gov the central government should be supreme. The reason why is because they would be able to uh, in, uh, create and protect a great commercial industrial nation, right? Um, the, uh, the Jeffersonians believe that that if there should be any kind of strong government, it should be closer to the people. So the states should actually have controlling interest over the federal government. The states should be able to ignore federal laws, right? Uh, and, and the states should be able to leave the union if they, if they needed to, okay? Um, and, and now when we think about the, in terms of economics, this is going to, it's the, the Democratic Republicans are going to be more in favor of an agrarian republic, okay? So we think about agriculture and we will think about, well, in the South, they have all these cotton plantations, but that's not what their, that's not what their vision is. Their vision is to create a, an, an agrarian middle class where the individual uh, landowner is a small kind of family farmer, prosperous family farmer, who is able to support himself and live out in the countryside and enjoy his liberty. Okay. You guys are with me with his family. All right. So, so even though the, uh, the Jeffersonians are mostly from the South, not all of them. Right. But uh, the, and, and they are agrarians. They're not with the, the agricultural Republic that they had in mind wasn't plantation agriculture. It was, uh, it was yeoman, what they call yeoman farmers, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the course. All right, questions, comment. So, so most of the Jeffersonians are from the South. Most of the Hamiltonians are from the North, particularly the Northeast, where we see, if you guys will remember, we already saw that the economy of the Northeast is moving towards commerce and industry and has been really almost from the beginning, right? You guys are with me, questions, comments. Okay, now um, there's a couple other things here. The American Revolution set in motion uh, decades of warfare between the British and the French. Um, and uh, so Britain, after the United States becomes independent, Britain and France are still at war with each other. And Britain and France both want the United States to be on their side. And so they're going to be lobbying people in America. Um, and it's it, the people who are the Federalists are going to be more in favor of the British, and, and if the United States were to support one side or the other, they would want to support the British. And the reason why is because the Brit Britain was their greatest trading partner. Okay, so now Britain was the greatest trading partner now, and, and they do eventually want to be able to compete with Britain. But for now, this is where most of their profit is coming from. So they, they don't want to see Britain lose the war. On the other hand, the French and the people who follow Jefferson are, are more in tune with uh, France because France is where 
the, the revolution happened. There's a great revolution of liberty. Americans uh, believe, in fact, Jefferson was in France in the French Revolution uh, and, and, and helped to kind of egg it on. So was Thomas Paine, the idea being that, uh, that the spark of liberty was struck in America and now it's going to spread to France and eventually it'll spread everywhere, right? So there's this idea of, of, uh, of this worldwide revolution of liberty that started in America and Jefferson and his followers want to enact that in the United States. This is, a, this is not an economic idea. This is a, a, an ideal, okay? Questions, comments of any of this? All right, so the last thing here, and this is very important, you have to pay attention to what I'm talking about now, okay? Loose construction is strict construction. This has to do with how is the Constitution interpreted? <clears throat> and um, the, there is a, or let's just say it this way first. But we'll start with the, the Democratic Republicans were what we call strict constructionists. And, and what a strict constructionist is, is somebody who believes that the, the, the Constitution explicitly defines the powers of the federal government. And if it's not explicitly defined in the Constitution, then the federal government cannot do it. Okay. And, and the first real test of this is going to be in Hamilton's uh, financial system. Hamilton was the first secretary of the treasury. And what Hamilton wanted to do was to create a national bank and to buy up state debts, the debts that the states had accumulated during the revolution, so that uh, the federal government then would be able to pay off those debts by taxing the states. Uh, and what the, the point of that was, was to, to raise the credit of the United States, essentially to restore the credit of the United States. It was kind of like, if you get a credit card and you borrow a bunch of money and then you don't pay the credit card, your credit sucks, right? Uh, but if you pay your credit card off, eventually you'll, your credit will be restored. You, you guys get what I'm saying? And it's the same thing here, okay? So Hamilton said, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, create a national bank that's going to, uh, to um, stabilize American currency and, and we're going to buy up state debts so that we can restore America's credit rating, okay? Well, the, 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 uh, where in the Constitution does it say that the, the federal government can create a, a national bank and buy up state debts? It doesn't. It doesn't stay it anywhere, okay? So they're going to say, well, you can't do that. That's unconstitutional. And then the, the uh, Federalists will respond by using what's called the Elastic Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause, which is a clause in the Constitution that says that the government can do whatever is necessary and proper to support the role, to support its role, okay? So what is the role of Congress or what is the role of the federal government is listed in the preamble, right? To, uh, to um, I can't even think of it off the top of my head in the morning early, but uh, to ensure the blessings of liberty on ourselves and our posterity and all these other things, uh, it's in, the, it's in the, the preamble. And what the elastic clause, according to the Hamiltonians, uh, what the elastic clause does is it gives, it gives an opening to enact laws that are necessary and proper to, to bring about uh, a functioning government, okay? And, and so what they say is, okay, we're using the loose, we're using the elastic clause to enact the national bank and the uh, buying up state debts because it's good. It's going to do for us what the constitution is supposed to do. All right. So this is going to be a permanent argument in American politics. What is the constitution? Is the constitution a dead document that once it's written, it can't be interpreted or is the constitution a living document that can be uh, that can be used as a way of um, of adopt ad adapting to the times. Okay, 
Now, again, in the beginning, it was the Jeffersonians who were the strict constitutionalists and the Hamiltonians who were the loose constructionists, or uh, they were the ones who said that the Constitution could be interpreted differently depending on the times, okay? But now, if we think about it in terms of today's politics, uh, and I'm just gonna, I'll, I'm just gonna bring up one, uh, one thing, right? One issue that was before the Supreme Court, which was, um, we call what do you call it? Same-sex marriage, right? Same-sex marriage. Okay. Well, the Constitution doesn't say anything about same-sex marriage. So the Constitution doesn't say anything about same-sex marriage. So how can the federal government rule on same-sex marriage? How can the same the federal government say that it's okay or it's not okay, right? Uh, but um, the court decided that uh, that same-sex marriage uh, could be supported by the federal constitution, even though it's not in there, because essentially because of the 14th Amendment, right? Okay, so so that's where we can see this this disconnect still exists in today's uh, political dialogue, right? It was the same-sex marriage. Another one is, say, is uh, gun rights, right? Some people uh, argue that the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, that the, the Constitution doesn't really anywhere stri- uh, explicitly grant an individual right to gun ownership. But the, the uh, Congress and the Supreme Court decided in 2010 that it did, okay? Uh, what about abortion, abortion rights, okay? The, uh, con- the, got the court in 1969 or 1970 decided that the, fe- the Constitution protected the rights of people who wanted to get abortions, um, and strict instructions say, well, where does it say that in the Constitution? You guys follow what I'm saying here? Okay, so this is an argument that still goes on uh, in American politics. It starts from the very beginning.